back. Sweet. Um, okay, so um, today the topic is contrasting cases in, in uh, science learning. Quick uh, reminder of the idea that when you do an analogy, you have to get an alignment between the two things that you're comparing. And that the important thing about that alignment is it has to foster seeing common relational structure. There are many kinds of similarities, typically, between two complex situations. But um, if you want people to, to grasp a, a particular common relational structure, which is very often the case in science analogies, that the alignment between the two things has to be such that the common relations correspond and the objects that, that also correspond are those that support the relational correspondence. Um, so parallel connectivity between the relational structures of the two domains, or at least the ones you pick out for the analogy, is crucial. Um, and a, a nice thing about the way we do analogy is we all tend naturally, um, depending on our, how much knowledge we have, to, tr to sort of enjoy those kinds of alignments. Um, we also like to align larger rather than smaller local structures. So there's some things about the way humans naturally analogize that can really work for us in, in uh, creating scientific learning of various kinds. So analogy could do at least three things and, and, and sort of routinely does. Um, um, it can highlight an abstract common relational structure so that it becomes a little more portable, a little more likely to be carried to another future example. It can promote making a future a further inference from the thing you know more about to the thing you know less about. And it can highlight alignable differences. And what I mean by an alignable difference is something, uh, a difference between the two systems that plays the same role in the common relational structure. Once you get that alignment, alignable differences will often pop out. That can be something we can use to promote learning by contrast. But all of these things depend on structural alignment. So just a very quick uh, illustration. If you want your geology professor, you want your introductory class to think about the inside uh, processes in, within the earth as a sort of convection from hot things that expand and rise and then uh, contractors they get cool and then go down again. This is what happens in the mantle. So you can show them an oil, a lava lamp and they can see those processes with their very eyes, perhaps correctly map, map it to the mantle. The, but in order to do that, they have to get the right, they have to get the structural alignment correct. Um, the oil goes with the mantle, for example, and the lamp goes with the core of the earth. If you are a young child and you don't quite have the relational background to understand this, uh, very much the way Jennifer Carmely just, and just talked about, you may uh, simply seize on some local colorful bit and um, say the bright yellow oil goes with the bright yellow core of the earth, in which case, the best thing we can hope for is that you won't learn anything, and of course, you could learn the wrong stuff. So, um, one of the things we have to worry about is how do we make sure, it, with, with learners who don't have much background, that it all works. Well, one way uh, that you can get an alignment to work is use high similarity. High similarity, which where the similarities in the objects are compatible, consistent with the best relational alignment, um, is, a, is what we call an invitation to compare. It, it, you, High similarity prompts comparison. You don't have to tell people compare these. They, we all notice high similarity whether we're ready for it or not. Um, and uh, furthermore, the, if you have high similarity, the object matches will support the, re, the relational match, and that means you're less likely to fall off the trolley and, and misalign. And alignable differences kind of pop out. So I don't think we have time to describe this, but but this just. All, all I'd ask you to take from this is there is, there is a, a, a computational model, and if you run the computational model, you'll find that a high similarity comparison will far faster and more inevitably lead to the correct um, relational comparison. So here's a, an experiment because, uh, after all, NSF is about basic research as well as, as well as applied, and we're talking about going from the lab to the classroom. This is very much a lab experiment. We gave people either pairs like, like say, the horizontal rows, so looking at the top two pairs. Um, if we ask you to say, are these same or different, you will uh, be, it'll be easier for you to say that the, uh, the top one and the one just below it are different than that the two top ones are different. In other words, in the same difference task, the more different things are, the faster you are to say different. That's a very old result. But if I ask you to say, to name a difference, say one thing that's different between them, you'll be much faster for the highly similar, highly alignment, high aligned pairs. So um, people who have to name a difference are much faster for 
highly alignable pairs, people who have to say whether the pairs are same different are much faster in the, in the opposite direction for very different pairs. Very interesting dissociation from the point of view of you know, understanding how similarity works. But um, the, the, the lesson here for, for the, taking this into the world is if you want people to see a specific difference that you have in mind, give them a highly alignable pair. They'll inevitably align it properly, and that, just that, that difference will then kind of leap out at them. They don't even have to look for it. It comes to them. Um, so we uh, in Silk are using a line of analogical comparison, particularly with spatial analogies, to promote Silk STEM learning in lots of different areas. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Here's one with adults, and then I'll talk about one with kids. So this is a, a study done with Ken Kurtz, where we wanted to see if we could use um, analogical comparisons to promote difference detection when there's something wrong with the figure. The application here would be maybe something like radiology, where people have to learn to detect very subtle flaws in a, um, you know, in a lung, for example. Um, so we asked people to find the wrongly placed bone, and we explained that uh, these these. Uh, the targets here were, perhaps you've all seen it by now, the targets were assembled by student archaeologists, so there might be a mistake. Um, and then for in some, this was all done within subject, but in some cases they would get a standard, which we told them was always correct. When there was a standard, it would be assembled by an expert, and it would have no mistakes. It might be missing bones, but no mistakes. Maybe by now it's easier to see where the wrong bone is, but in case not, that's where it is. And of course, what we predict is if we present the standard, the target, along with a correct standard that's alignable, you'll be better and faster at detecting the bone, um, even though you have to process more materials. And the, the, the dependent measures here are accuracy at, at clicking on the bone and uh, time. And response times are 10 to 20 seconds. I mean, this is not a fast task. Um, the, all of the skeletons are different and so on. To, t to control for amount of information and show that it really is, has to do with alignment, we gave other, in another third of the, of the examples of the trials, we gave a reversed standard, which has, of course, all the same information, but it's harder to spatially align it. And uh, basically everything matters. So um, the single is less accurate than the non-alignable comparison, which is less accurate than the alignable comparison. And um, the, 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 interestingly, the, Sorry, the, at the bottom row, the uh, greater than sign should go in the other direction. The single is fastest. The alignable and non-alignable take longer, um, and that is because the single people often just give up. And, and so we have many sort of five-second reaction times where they just randomly click. So we didn't really get the response time prediction, although the alignable ones are non-significantly faster than the non-alignable ones, where you see the differences in accuracy. So. Uh, we also found that after they've done some of these, they're better able to detect errors in new skeletons that they haven't seen before. So there's some sort of structural learning and learning of the kinds of, of faults that they're likely to run into. So that was the adult study. Now carrying on into kids, this is a, a study that we've carried out with our colleagues at the University of Chicago. Um, with uh, in the Ch Chicago Children's Museum, uh, something I'd always wanted to do was see if you could bring analogy into a museum and you know in a sort of really fun way and 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 see if kids could profit from it. So this is a, a, a exercise in which kids build a skyscraper with their families. Um, they have these kind of tinker toy like things, although much Lego like things. Um, that are specially designed, and they have a platform there where they're encouraged to build a building that reaches to the sky. Problem, the, the buildings were often collapsing. Um, and the reason they collapse is kids don't understand the basic principle of construction, which is you can't just put in horizontals and verticals, even though that looks really tidy. Um, it won't stand up, right? Because uh, if you look at that middle diagram, if you've got nothing but horizontals and verticals, you can push on a corner and, the, and the, distort the shape. Whereas if you have triangles, um, you, you have a stable polygon. You can't distort a shape without actually breaking it or bending it, its sides. So you, you need to stick in diagonals and do something to make triangles. So how do you teach little kids that? That's not something they have in mind when they start. Um, we used, we, we got uh, basically two minutes with each child before they started running in the, in the building the building with their parents. This was supposed to be fun activity, so this had to be fast. So before they go in and, you know, sit on the platform and build their own building and with their families, we get them for two minutes and we show them a pair of buildings. If you just look on the right side, that's the high alignability pair. Prediction is that should do really well because 
they can uh, easily align everything about the building so the difference between the diagonal and the horizontal cross beam will leap out at them. Um, on the left, you see a low alignability pair where the same distinction is there, but because we because the buildings are hard to align, there are extraneous differences and so on, that it's not going to be it's not going to be as easy to align it. They should be less likely to see the key difference. There's also a no training group that gets no nothing at all. So we just, you know, we say which building is stronger and they guess fairly randomly. Then we say wiggle them, let's check it out. And when you wiggle them you find out that the one without a brace will wiggle all the way to the ground. Now all the kids I think there were only eight out of about hundred and 60 kids who failed to note at that point which building was stronger. So uh, that's good. So now they go and they build a building with their families, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, and that's fun. And we have scored those data, and there is an effect of comparison. But the data are also, we, don't, we can't use all the kids. Some of them were sitting behind their brother when they made the key move and so on. So th those data are fairly noisy. So I'm going to tell you about uh, the the one minute repair task where we again got the kids alone at the end of the study for one, just one little response. We showed them a new building. We said, this building is wobbly. Can you show me where to put this piece to make it strong? And we hand the kid a beam and the kid basically holds it up. We don't make them screw it in. They just hold it up. And then you say, you know, did they do a, hor a diagonal or did they do a vertical or a horizontal? Um, so it's, 50 percentage chance, and these are the results. Um, you see age going across, that's, you know, from six to eight. Um, and the, uh, the yellow bar is no training. The purple bar is, lavender bar is uh, low alignment. The maroon bar is high alignment. And this is just the proportion who put in a diagonal. So um, first thing to notice is it's really hard. At six, uh, with no training, not even the eight-year-olds get you get a, a above chance. And um, the six-year-olds are below chance. Um, I think that's because horizontals and verticals, you know, look like the right way to build to a kid. There, so this is, not, this is not starting a chance. I think it's starting below chance. But even so, um, we see an effect of uh, comparison and we see effect of alignment. Um, and so all of these differences matter. High alignment is better than low alignment and both both comparison groups together are better than, uh, than nothing. So very encouraging. Um, uh, and we see two things, really, in terms of bringing this to the world. We see that spatial analogies can help give kids a, at least a beginning on, on understanding an important engineering principle, but also that they need a lot of support. Things are very, you know, you, you can't just throw an analogy out. You have to really give kids the support of high, high alignability. It's not a coincidence also that we put the buildings right next to each other. We know from other studies that if you even put them diagonally like this, it'll be harder to see the alignment. Sort of all those spatial things matter. Um, we also asked, could we beef this up a bit? If I'm starting to run over, let me know. Oh, great. Um, could we beef this up? Um, could we get the youngest kids to, to do better? Um, now, I'm not sure if we really got it down to six. We ran from five and a half to seven and a half, so that's going to be a bit older than six on the average. But this was a study we did in the lab where we added uh, a spatial language manipulation. So we, we, we ran, in this case, just two groups, high alignability, low alignability. This is done with Micah Goldwater. And uh, we first replicated what we did in the museum. We just gave them the two buildings, said which one is strong, you know, they wiggle. And then uh, after a short delay, we let them put in a piece to a new building. And indeed, the ones who got high alignment are more likely to see the correct um, diagonal and to uh, use a diagonal when they repair a new building. So that was reassuring. Um, and then uh, we go on to say, um, do you remember, we, again, abilities that we say, do you remember which one was strong? And the, the uh, kid usually remembers. They remember that, you know, the building with the brace was strong. And, and in the language group, this is the manipulation, we say, yes, this one has a brace. We don't point to the brace. We just use that word. And we, in the control group, we just say, yes, this one is strong. So simple design. It's, they got higher low alignability, or, and they did or did not get the, the brace sort of um, hint. And then we take them to this transfer task where they get buildings that don't look as similar to the old buildings. And they have to say which one is stronger. 
And what we find is that uh, we get an effect of both alignment and uh, spatial language. So uh, if you, if you um, let's see, starting, starting on, the, on the left side, if you're in the low alignment condition, you're really, you don't even a chance if that's all you got was that low alignability pair. But in that condition, if, if you were the lucky kid to whom we said, yes, this one has a brace, you're now really doing well. You're above chance, and uh, you know, it's, it's quite a sizable gain. And even if you're in the high alignment condition, where you already had a fair degree of insight from having successfully aligned, saying the word brace seems to make, seems to still confer a further advantage. And, um, and uh, we find that 100% of the six and a half, I've never had 100% of kids do anything, um, <laughs> succeeded. Um, so what, what did that word do? Of course, we're only guessing, but I think one of the things it did is it suggested that there's one difference, that, that, that syntax. Also, it suggested that there was something more to be gained from the comparison than perhaps they had gained so far, particularly to the kids in the low alignment condition. Um, we could speculate more, but okay. There are lots of open questions. Um, analogy doesn't always work, um, but so that's one question. Let's put that aside because I think that's a very long question. But another question is even here where it worked, what do kids really get? I mean, obviously, they're not ready to go out and be engineers. Uh, do they really even understand, you know, why a triangle is important? Or you have, have any inkling of it? Do they understand that it's about triangles as opposed to just diagonals? These are all questions that I think you know, need to be thought about. Um, and, and, a, and a thing that sort of goes with that is, what can we combine with analogy to sort of really harvest these gains and, and make them into something more than just a momentary insight? Um, and self-explanation would be one. I think critiquing analogies is a very good exercise for people who uh, are, are sophisticated enough to do that. Um, should, would further comparisons work? Would articulating the common principle help? Linking to a provided principle? You know, these are all things that um, have been investigated by various researchers and I think are, will probably be very fruitful. Um, so uh, I'll close by showing my collaborators uh, and also, sorry, thanking um, NSF and ONR for their support on this work. But let's get back to the collaborators. Thank you. So why don't we do uh, a few questions? now, and then we'll save some time at the end of the question session. Greg, hi. <laughs> I see you've done some of the work with uh, radio, you've worked with radiologists, was that, that right? No, so? that, no, the, we are hoping our work is, uh, is analogous <laughs> to <laughs> the problems they face. I, I, there's a, a I could, think of a series of domains, of ill-defined domains, in which there really is acquisition of expertise, but the getting there takes a long time. So radiology is a classic one. They can eventually just, the experts supposedly can look at something, oh, this is an example of such and such. Another one is geoscience, where apparently the effort to become an expert geoscientist is very long, along the way to tenure before they often get there, I'm told. Um, I know that there's some work, Robbie Jacobs, if you know him, at the University of Rochester, trained as a visual scientist, um, and uh, now he's using a lot of machine learning approaches to this. And I wonder to what extent you had actually engaged some of these machine learning models to how many exemplars are you seeing and to what extent are you going to extract an example of, oh, that's this kind of geologic formation and not another one. And I wonder if you could pull out of it that in the contrast cases they're getting, there's implicit similarity matrices. That's a really interesting idea. Um, well, so you, you kind of couldn't have asked a better question in that. Um, number one, I think I, that would actually be a cool thing to look at. In general, I have to say, I, th I think a lot of machine learning models are completely on the wrong track because they're trying to do this with feature lists and they, and they, don't, they don't represent relations. If you don't represent relations, I don't think you can get off the launching pad for, for a lot of these insights. But I think the issue of what cases work and what don't, would be a, a, that would be a cool way to look at machine learning. Of course, we have a com computational model, um, uh, SME, which, is, uh, which, which does a pretty good job of doing some relational learning. And now we have CogSketch with it, as uh, uh, Jennifer Cronley was mentioning, which does automatic representation of the spatial relations within a diagram. So you don't even have to hand code anymore, which is great. Um, and so we, we hope to capture some of that. But, um, 
uh, geoscience has actually been a major focus of silk. And uh, in fact, um, Brian Matlin sitting in back there has done some work on, actually I could, there's probably too many people in the room to name, but uh, that, you know, Elise, uh, uh, Steve, um, uh oh, I knew this was gonna happen. Yes, <laughs> right. I mean, the, the room is, there's several people in the room who've done interesting work on, uh, on geoscience, some of them applying um, structural alignment as well as well as other principles. Um, yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. It's a domain that's really hard and a domain that can benefit from um, anything that begins to make the sort of structure of the stimuli more clear to people earlier and faster. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about adding the spatial language? I, you said it very briefly, but you said that particular spatial language suggests that what is it about putting it in, what is it about putting things in words that can help people think about space? Boy, you know, I think language is, is, can be important in a variety of different ways. This is one of the, one of the themes that, uh, that I actually pursue in my work on analogy is this sort of interplay between um, language labels and constructions and, and uh, comparison processes. So for example, one thing that we've done a lot of work on is giving two, it's a very simple idea, giving two things the same name prompts comparison. So when you say these are both blickets, kids are much more likely to compare them, see what's, see perhaps some relational commonality that they totally missed when they looked at the two items individually and be able to transfer that to a third item. And saying, we've, we've, Laura, Naomi, and I have, have messed with this. If you just say, see, these are alike, show me the other one that's alike, it doesn't work as well as saying, this is a blicket and this is a blicket. Can you see why they're both blickets? Show me the other blicket. That works much better. So early on, kids believe that words are about like kinds. And so you can, they, they take seriously likeness when, when it's, when a label goes with it. Even adults seem to do better when you use labels. And one of the things I think labels invite you to do is when you get the commonalities, keep them. There's a name for them. And you may, and because it has a name, there's, we, we have a sort of uh, uh, habit of, of thinking that could come up again. You know, so so it's, it's, by the time you learn language, it's sort of become a well-oiled routine that if, it's, if there's a named commonality, it might be use, useful to keep. Um, in the case of the brace, that was an interesting difference from, the, from what I've been talking about because there we're saying one of them has something that the other one doesn't, right? So it's, it's a contrast. It's a, the use of analogy to invite contrast. I'm only speculating when I say that uh, I'm, I bet that the, the fact that it's a singular term also said there's one difference. Um, but, you know, that's my speculation. Um, but what, but I, what I think it did say is there's something you can tell. There's some difference you can tell, uh, at least one, and that's, that matters to, to this, the fact that you can wiggle one and not the other. So it was just kind of, I think, an instruction that there was something they should be able to see. So if they had failed to align in the low alignment condition, I think this told them, wait a minute, you know, try again. That, that's, so you could maybe look at this with eye movements. I think they actually looked again when you said that. That's my, you know, so it's speculation. Yeah. 